And now it's time for the general manager report. And as you know, these general manager reports have been pretty much completely useless. He doesn't really give us any information. I mean, they really operate in secret over there and very, very little information is shared with the public. It's a, a true crime syndicate going on here. So let's hear what his Sammy to Manny D'Souza's report is. Monthly report, General Manager D'Souza. Good morning, Manny President D'Souza. Simmons, uh, Board Director, Staff, and the public. And Thank you all for being here with us today. We really appreciate that and all of the public comments. Um, this morning, we will be sharing timely information on our operator shortage oh, yeah, and upcoming operating. service adjustments that need to be made to make the system more reliable. Um, also, the countdown underway to launch of TriMets at, at So here, you see, there you go right off the bat. So here we have this system that's not operational. Okay. But he's launching a new service. And I've been complaining about this for years. How they're expanding. They should have never been expanding any of this shit. And all of my, all of my predictions came true. But I'm just Al, that weirdo. He hates everybody. He hate, he's a hater. He's a hater. <laughs> no, I'm a realist. I saw what they were doing. And they fucked their riders. And they completely fund their pork barrel. They completely fund their management. I mean, they cut 20%. But they didn't get a 20% cut. They got a raise. So the level of criminality is astounding, astounding. And his, his hypocrisy is astounding. And they get away with it, of course, because nobody cares about this. Why would you? All the world's falling apart around us. You think anybody's thinking about TriMet? No. Why would they? It doesn't, they don't care. They don't even use it. Nobody even uses the fucking TriMet. It's just this money laundering machine for the people like him and all these other people. And, you know, it's a stepping stone for Ozzy and Kathy and Lori and Thomas. Mills is a professional. He's been there for like, who knows? I mean, 30 years in one of the high executive positions, making nice big fat check. I'll have a nice big fat retirement. Meanwhile, you're not, your bus isn't showing up and you're being tortured on a daily basis. X, which, which is frequent, frequent express, express bus service. Except it's not frequent anymore. They cut that too. <laughs> Jesus. Our main ridership report numbers, and then I'll do uh, a transit-oriented development update. See, see, nothing. He talked about nothing. He talked. No, why are you even in the trend? All they do is property. Oh God, see, I can't. I should never watch these. It's just aggravating. I mean, it's like watching Biden or watching Trump. It's just you're watching liars lie to you on stage like this. They're just lying to you in your face. Why would you subject yourself to that? And that's, he's doing the same thing. He's, he's not going to touch on any of the real issues. I mean, they're going to have their property development scams going. And that, that, that whole division thing was nothing but a pork barrel money grab. Just like every one of their capital projects is. Not one of those projects helps you. Think of the military industrial complex. Doesn't help you at all. Well, the TriMet industrial complex doesn't help you either. And now you are tortured by TriMet. It's gone from, it used to be fairly reliable back in my day, okay? Now it's completely a useless transit system. I mean, they actually forced people back into their cars. They talk about their carbon footprint when they've ruined their transit system. They're doing the opposite of what they should be doing. And they keep complaining about it's a worldwide operator shortage. Yeah, but you won't mitigate it by raising the salaries to the level where you will attract good people. You refuse to do that, which means you have no legitimacy. We know you're lying. Those of us that follow this, we know you're a liar. You're a career liar. You smile well, but everything that comes out of your mouth is a lie. We, we are, are making strides in our operator hiring as employees across the agency are helping us to bring more operators on board. Why? We've been He's lying to our face. Averaging about 70 to 80 applications per week. 
and our training classes are filling up, which are 26. Maximum. Yeah, see that? Why aren't you getting training classes 56? Why aren't you getting training classes 112? Why aren't you mobilizing to, fu to fix this? You're not. You're doing nothing. You're a liar. You're intentionally destroying the system, just like McFarland did in 2008. You're doing the exact same. You are McFarland 2.0. But you're black, so we have to like you, right? Because you're black, and therefore you can't be evil, right? Yeah, well, Obama brought us Trump, and Biden will bring us Trump point two. Currently, between February and the start of June, a fifth of applicants indicated that they were referred by employees. Who cares? We are offering a modest bonus for employees who refer candidates. But I believe so many referrals shows the commitment of our workforce. What a fucking joke this guy is. <laughs> I love the way he spins this. It shows the commitment. What a, what? Oh, my God. Uh, boosting our ranks. So really appreciate our workforce. Oh, but unfortunately, God. despite all of our efforts to hire operators, we're still in a deficit. Yeah, and because we, you want to be in a deficit. You've created it. You, you piggybacked off the New World Order that destabilized the entire world so that billionaires could trickle their wealth. The masses are too stupid to see they're being fucked with. They just go about their business. If I were an operator there, I would be wildcatting, man. I wouldn't. I, they'd ha they've had me out the door. I would be pushing for wildcats all the time. It's like you're conditioned. You're, you've done nothing for your operators. Nothing. Yeah, I gave them a thousand bucks. Big deal. You gave them a day off, big deal. You owe them an additional, let's see, seven thousand, six thousand five hundred dollars. It will be for a couple of months to come. That means that our customers are experiencing more canceled buses and max trains. And because of this, we must take a step that none of us want to do, but it's really needed to make the schedule more reliable. No, it's called austerity. It was planned ahead of time. We know it. You're lying. You're hiding behind it because you're you're following the playbook of oligarchy. Find an excuse to destroy what you need to destroy. So I've asked our mobility plan and policy director Tom Mills to join us. There he is. At... Mobility planning and policy. Mobility planning. There is no more. You're a failed transit agency. You are failed. He led the planning for a temporary cut in service levels that were going to temporary. Effect. Stop lying. It's not temporary. It's permanent. These are these liars are as much as Biden and Trump. He, there's, they're a little bit better at it though than Biden and Trump. See how they're more, they're more, they're able to actually give you an argument that most people will believe. Like ninety five percent of people will believe this because he's rational in his argument. You look at Biden, you go, he's just senile, which he is. You look at Trump, he's just a buffoon, which he is. Now, this guy plays the part. He knows how to play this part better than either of those idiots. In September. Tom? Yeah, give it to Tom. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, as uh, Sam mentioned, uh, this is not a conversation that any of us look forward to. Uh, but That doesn't affect you, so you don't care. You didn't lose anything. You didn't get a salary cut. You got a salary raise. So you're lying. You don't want to have the conversation, but it has no effect on you. So you're a liar. Unfortunately, it is needed uh, given the state of affairs with operator uh, shortages and uh, wanting to remain reliable uh, for our customers. <laughs> it's not reliable. It's not going to be reliable. If they cut it. They cut it. Still not reliable. Now they still cut it. It's not reliable. Even after these cuts, it still won't be reliable. Okay. We already know how this is going to play out, folks. These people are professional liars and they're lying. Uh, so uh, if we can switch to the next slide. Uh, what we're showing you here is a graph showing uh, missed trips uh, for the month of May. Uh, typically what happens when uh, an operator can't be, uh, be there for work, whether it be they're sick, uh, they're on vacation, uh, or if uh, we just didn't have enough operators to fill out all the runs, we have an, a, a, a kind of a 
supply of operators we call the extra board that fill in for look at this look at this look at this chart work uh, but when that Wait extra board gets used up and we still have unfilled runs this is an uh, interesting chart look at that chart so they're saying okay here's the most missed trips that's in, just an interesting chart now it's gone to here hmm okay they say okay they say it out loud I, I, I'm too hard on them I suppose I mean they're even tweeting now okay that they they are not reliable due to they even tweet it so okay maybe I'm maybe I'm too hard on the motherfuckers but I, I don't believe that they didn't know this was coming. I know I know they did know this was coming, and then they let it happen. And and that gives me a proof in my mind that this was all intentional. The garage managers do an incredible job of, of uh, reaching out to operators and have taken their days off. And many operators do uh, come in on their days off and work for us. Uh, but sometimes we were just not able to fill all the runs. And uh, as our operator shortages have increased, uh, we've been missing more and more runs. And you can see in this graph, uh, the operators are getting sick constantly. I mean, it's it's tenuous there. You cheaped out on the bus barriers, so they're still getting attacked because you didn't spend the money to get the proper barrier. Okay, that's on you. That's on you, to sue. That's one hundred percent on you that you allowed yourself to to cheap out on bus barrier. When it comes to services. They give you nothing. And this is the same playbook that happens in the United States government. When it comes to helping people, there's zero. When it comes to funding war, there's unlimited. Same playbook here. When it comes to actually helping your riders or your drivers, nothing. When it comes to your capital projects, it's got, it, there's no limit. Same playbook, exactly. There are days when you know, we're approaching 90 uh, missed trips a day. Um, and uh, it just seems to kind of be getting worse. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So if we project out uh, into the fall, using our average attrition rate of uh, 16 bus operators uh, leaving per month, plus the additional... Did you hear that? 16 operators are leaving per month. So now they're that now they're in a bad spiral. This this I, I my opinion at this point is that TriMet should be dissolved and sold off. It's basically. There's no purpose to it anymore other than money laundering and jobs for people that can't get jobs, like myself, okay? I mean, I needed a job. It's time they gave me a job. And when I started there, they were actually a good company. You know, great benefits, great pay, decent runs. But, boys, things changed since uh, 1996. Service hours that we expect uh, to have for division, line, excuse me, FX to division. Uh, we can kind of project out how many operators uh, will be short in the fall. Uh, we see in that blue bar our possible class graduate, or graduates per class. So our typical class uh, is 26 students. Uh, however, we haven't been able to fill uh, a class all the way up to 26 for some time. Now that is changing. I don't believe that. I, I believe they had plenty of applications. And we already have evidence that they had three times the applications that they actually hired. So they are rejecting people, and we don't know why. We don't know what is their criteria. But uh, in the past, we haven't. So at one point, we were only graduating about 11 students uh, per class. Uh, that's the class size of 13, so not even the full 26. Uh, but if we assume that things are going to get better, uh, and we have class sizes of 26, you can see that we can then assume maybe 22 graduate or maybe uh, drop out during uh, training. That would still put us short 32 operators in the fall. Uh, now, we are hoping to increase our class sizes, our ability to train more folks at one time, uh, to 33. And so uh, if we're able to graduate about 28 per class between now and the end of the year, we expect only a, a shortage of about four. So that would be really manageable. Um, but the uh, the 32 is kind of where we're, we're targeting here. Um, and in order to remain reliable, uh, emergency temporary service reduction would have to be uh, put into place in fall of 22. And, I should say and they won't be reliable, just so I, I reiterate the point that 
They're not going to be reliable no matter what they do. They're just not going to be reliable. They never were completely reliable. They were somewhat reliable when I was there. But even when I was there, you know, I remember driving the 88 on a Sunday, and it's only once an hour, and my bus broke down. So what happens to all those people waiting for the bus? And then the bus behind me broke down. So, I mean, they're never prepared is what I'm trying to say. They've never been prepared in my entire history with these people, and they're not, not going to be prepared now. Say that would be September 18th of 2022. Next slide. So how are we going to go about doing this? Well, what's the approach that we want to take to this? So uh, our, our view is it's easier to, uh, to not improve service as much as we had planned to improve service what rather than take service away. What do you mean not? You're, you're taking service away. You didn't improve anything. First thing we decided to do is look at what is it that we plan to improve for 2022, and maybe we can pull back on that a little bit. Still make improvements, but pull back a little bit. Uh, as well as uh, look at low ridership uh, bus lines that don't serve uh, a large concentration of Title VI communities, uh, as well as look at some of the peak service on our frequent service lines. The frequent service lines largely haven't been uh, reduced at all since uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but they do have some peak service on them that uh, is not being used as well as much as, much as it was before, and so that's the place where we can make it do. Uh, next slide. So more specifically, looking at kind of those three buckets, uh, the first being, uh, okay, well, maybe we don't upgrade as well, much as we said we were going to upgrade. So this uh, division FX, or I guess I should say FX2 division, uh, we had planned for six-minute uh, peak service, 12-minute service all day. And we would still do that, although the peak service would be for less uh, amount of time in, in the rush hour. Uh, in fact, we would really minimize it to the bare minimum. Uh, and the majority of the line would just be 12 minutes. 40 operator safe, so you know what that is. That's $100,000 per operator times 40. And so that means they save... And this is how I look at it. Four million dollars that they say, okay, that they're going to use for something else. Look at it from the viewpoint of the money. Forget about the service. Look at the money. Because it's always about the money. They're trying to pretend they can't control the situation. We know they can control it. They, they could fast track training they could double or triple the trainers they could do something about this if they wanted to but they don't want to because this is an austerity measure that's really what's happening it's being cloaked as some kind of emergency temperature and that's just a lie you know that's just a lie uh, all day which is still a really high frequency and uh greater than what our frequent service standards are and typical of a bus rapid transit uh, additionally, we had hoped to increase uh, weekday service on line 10, which is uh, taking over for some of the line 2, that the FX line will not take over. Um, instead, we're going to uh, hold that uh, frequency at the rate that it is today. Um, but the good news there is we are still planning to add weekend service uh, to, to line 10, and that is because, uh, again, it's taking over for a portion of line 2 that the FX line will not take. Uh, the next bucket is uh, reduce or suspend. Really, we, I should change this to say cancel service on lines that have low Title VI communities as well as low ridership lines. So the lines that you see that are bolded uh, are uh, line 50 and 92. Those would be lines that we, are, are rec we want to go ahead and cancel. Those lines are very low ridership lines. Uh, they only operate during rush hour. Uh, they're intended to get people to either directly to downtown or get people to the training center where they go to downtown. The 50 was formerly the uh, Cedar Mill shuttle, which was operated by our friend Bob Crowley. You know, when they actually cared about getting people to ride their transit system, they provided this service to people in the hills. Get, try to get them out of their car. Remember the whole choice rider baloney? 
it, we want the choice riders. Well, that turned out to be a complete disaster. And again, with people working from home, uh, they, they were low pre-pandemic, and now they're even low. Uh, lines 1, 18, and 26, those also are uh, lines that have low ridership. Just get uh, rid of them. I would just dump them. Just cancel them completely. Cancel the runs. You know, there's no point in having a run that doesn't run. Okay, what's the point of having a bus that's like once an hour or just rush hours only? Just get rid of it completely. People will buy cars. They'll figure out a way to get out of it, you know? Just like you did on when you opened all the mat, the west and the green line. You cut all the services on the west side. You fucked a lot of people then, too. Of course, they're not going to talk about any of that. Uh, however, they do have a uh, good ridership to do for getting kids to high school students to class, uh, to school. So we are recommending that we reduce those lines, uh, but we maintain the high school trips. In fact, that's all that we would uh, keep on those lines are the high school trips. And then lastly, lines 81 and 82. Line 81, we actually added some service to that line during the pandemic because of capacity restrictions. That line served as Amazon Distribution Center. Uh, That's the one that should be cut. Let Amazon worry about their own transportation. Why Why are you providing transportation to Amazon? Because it's neoliberalism. That's why. He's a he's a, one of the richest men in the world, and he's getting government-funded uh, transportation to his facility. But now that we don't have capacity restrictions, we don't need the extra service, and uh, we can accommodate both with the capacity that we had prior to the pandemic. Liars. And lastly, line 82 is a low ridership line. Yeah, uh, get that that just get rid of it. Get it out of it. hourly. And then the last bucket uh, is reducing weekday peak service on free service lines. Line 8 uh, specifically is a line that uh, we really didn't reduce the service at all during the pandemic. It goes to OHSU, which is why we didn't uh, reduce it. Uh, however, it has a number of trips uh, that run from downtown up to the hill only. And the reason they're there was to deal with overloads. So, you know, it, it starts in northeast Portland and it builds it would fill up, and then when it got downtown, people would transfer it, and it would get overloaded. So we added trips prior to the pandemic uh, to be able to accommodate that. Well, we don't have that problem anymore, so we're looking at Of course, we don't have the problem with the pandemic as you sit in your office away from everybody because of the pandemic. You see, they're talking... The bus drivers, the bus riders, they're all stuck together. And here you people are scared to meet in person, but you're preaching. We don't have that problem anymore. So you're hypocrites and liars. And I'm going to keep saying it over and over because that's what you are. Okay. And I'm the only one that will say it. And maybe nobody will see it, but I see it. I bear witness to your lies. One one man out in the world is bearing witness to your lies. Those trips out. Uh, additionally, line 9 and line 72. Those are lines that have... They're going to reduce to 72. It's just, it's just great. A lot of service, um, but they have a, even extra service uh, in the rush hour uh, that really isn't as necessary. Uh, they would still have very high levels of service uh, once we take those trips out. Altogether, we would say 40 operators. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we have that target of 32 or so. Um, but this uh, 40 operators gives us a little bit of space uh, to, to play with here. I understand the logic, but I don't agree with how they got here. I, I really do believe that they did all of this on purpose. They destroyed the system on purpose. They don't really want to bring it back. This is this. I really believe that. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So I just want to show where it is we're talking about. So. Uh, the, the line, you can see the, the division FX line and the line 10. Uh, again, this is uh, not taking something away, but just not improving to the level that we plan to improve. The next slide, please. Uh, these are the low, the line serving low Title VI communities and low ridership crowds. Uh, the, the dark lines are the lines that would go away. Uh, you see one going to uh, Beaverton. That's an express line. It actually only serves the outer Beaverton portion of the rest of the way. It doesn't stop in both campuses of downtown. Again, not it, it was from an era when people were uh, had bedroom communities and communities in downtown. That doesn't really seem to be the case anymore. 
Uh, and then the, the line 50 is the one above uh, Highway 26. I will point out. You know what I'm finding interesting here is they're not rolling out. I, we already know they hired Jared Walker to help to consult. I mean, they gave him a pork barrel contract because you know they, they give him pork. They, they you know he's he's one of the big recipients of public transportation money, but they're not rolling them out here for some reason. They're not rolling them out. I'm surprised. There will be an adjustment to the, the boundary, uh, but we would want to go ahead and grandfather uh, anyone who did use lift in that area. Uh, over the last year, that it would be grandfathered into the lift program, but we wouldn't uh, keep, or we wouldn't add new lift customers. And then the gray lines serving downtown Portland, those lines are the ones that we would uh, only have served the high school trip. And then the lines in Gresham and Troutdale uh, are the, the two lines, the one in South Gresham uh, is the hourly line, and the other one uh, in Troutdale, just a handful of trips that uh, we added during the pandemic. Next uh, slide. And then lastly, uh, line 72, excuse me, line 8, line 9, Powell, and line yeah. 72, which is going towards the 82nd Avenue. Again, these all would still have very high ridership, or excuse me, very high frequency, uh, but just uh, not the super frequency that it has today. Next slide. Why about, yeah, why do that, right? Uh, so the service reduction uh, pre pandemic, so right now, or since pre pandemic, right now we are at about a 90% reduction, slightly more. Um, and we think that uh, this reduction would get us to 22%. Uh, not where we want to go, trending in the wrong direction, uh, but we think that this will be uh, the last one. And this is our, our temporary. This is, we intend for this to be temporary. Yeah. And it won't be. I guarantee you, it won't be. Next slide. What you're seeing is the end of public transportation, as well as the end of life on, you know, what we're seeing is the deconstruction of everything that we used to have as citizens here. You know, all the way from you're forced to take a shot, now you have to, you're forced to take a baby, you're forced to walk. I mean, you, what you're witnessing is the actual turn, it's called the fourth turning, where, where there's going to be, we're seeing a war that we have no business in being involved in. We're fucked, okay? And all of this is just part of this agenda, this this uh, Agenda 2030. And speaking of uh, temporary and wanting to restore service, so we're aiming to begin adding back service hours uh, in 2023. Uh, as Sam had mentioned, uh, we're, we're getting new operators in the door, so that's really great. Uh, but it really depends on those operator ranks and making sure that not just new operators are coming in, but we're also uh, slowing the attrition rate as well. Um, as we add back service, we're going to rely on the forward together process to guide our The forward plans. together. They give them the cutest little name. You ever notice how they give them all a little cute name? The four, we're all in this together nonsense. And that's the biggest fucking lie there is. You're not all in this together. This guy's making 300 grand a year. This guy's making three seventy-five grand a year. You're not in this with the transit riders. You're not in it together. So don't give us this four together crap. We will be coming to you with uh, a proposal for forward together. Um, forward together. And because it's of so that, cute. you know, the service would look different than what it was prior to the, the reduction. Yes, yeah, so they're never going to bring back your service. All of this is lies. It's never coming back. They're lying. I'm going to keep saying it because I know it's true. So some of those lines that are really low ridership uh, may not be in the forward together program. The forward together. It's forward uh, together, uh, Rippy. It's forward. We're going forward together. We're all in this together. Does anybody actually believe any of this stuff? Do people believe Biden? I guess the shit libs do. It's like the morons of Trump actually believe him. They actually, when Trump talks, they actually believe him. It's like, you got to really be stupid to not be able to see he's full of shit. That's a level of stupidity I was unaware of until he showed up. I already knew Americans were dumb, but I really was shocked at just how stupid they are. I mean, wow. Uh, because uh, you know, they were low ridership prior to the, the uh, pandemic and uh, Maybe it doesn't make sense to restore those. Get rid of it. Yeah. 
Uh, lastly, I just want to mention with the service uh, reduction, I don't have a slide for this, but uh, just to say that uh, we have already started reaching out to partners, uh, reaching out to Apano, uh, reaching out to PCC Southeast, uh, reaching out to OHSU, uh, Mountain Community College, uh, as well as uh, neighborhood groups and the jurisdiction. Yes, your, com your community group. We're, we're reaching out to community gr organizations. Yes, fuck you. Is that it? <laughs> Tom, thank you. Uh, President Simmons, I don't know if you want to wait until the end of the GEO report for the board questions or if you want to do it now. Um, why don't we see if there's anyone that has any questions now? Um, those of us on Come on, Ozzy. I want a question from you, Ozzy. You're the smartest man in that room. Let's see some questions coming out of that brain of yours. Opportunity to raise questions. So if Director Wei or uh, Director Kim have questions, what about I Director think now would be a good time. Ozzy, open your fucking mouth. Um... Yeah, I think my question would be, are we are we doing anything with community colleges, um, you know, other sources where, again, we can kind of draw from a work? You know, I, this is all, there's no point in asking questions. All of this is decided. It's over. It's over, okay? They didn't ask you before they did this. They they did it. Now you're now you're asking questions that are there's no point to ask. Of course, that we need because I'm looking at things from um, also just a long term. You know, how are we gonna again? How are we going to replenish this operator shortage um, workforce issue? So I'm just curious if we have any plans around that, short term, long term strategies, um, more collaboration, again, more partnership. I'm just using higher education as an example, but um, sure. yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'll do my best to answer that, but I'm also going to ask if uh, Kim Sewell is able to draw, I think she's on the webinar, uh, our executive director. We're forward together. Like a relation. Uh, I do know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, we are doing something particularly with uh, community colleges and, and trade schools uh, for our um, kind of maintenance uh, and trying to fill positions in maintenance. I'm not sure uh, where we are with operators. Kim, I see you're on the line. If you, uh, I can hand it off to you. Sure. Um, thanks for the question, Direct Away. Yes, we have a lot of partnerships and, and contacts with the local community. Um, different community agencies um, trying to draw from their uh, program for all of our workforce. And we've actually expanded our job fair efforts, our recruiting efforts, really trying to make sure that we are reaching out and connecting with um, all of those potential sources for employment. And there's even some efforts we're looking at to look at some of the minimum qualifications on the jobs. They're doing everything but raising the pay and raising the bonus. They're doing everything but what they actually need to do. And nobody seems to mention it but me. The, the job has to pay significantly more. Okay. Significant. You need to start them at 33 and top them at 40. And you're not going to do it because you're criminals. See if there's a way to directly connect with both high schools and colleges. So all of that is on the table for sure. Yeah, it's on the table. Directly, right I would also say, um, one, just to let the full board know, and um, just two weeks ago, I was down in San Diego, and one of the things that Kim and Angela and her team, recruitment team, we are also recruiting in different cities and different states throughout the United States. They always and did that. I had several CEOs um, down at the conference tell me to stop poaching their operators from their states and cities to bring them to Portland. So Kim has done a really good job. They do the same thing as, as executives do. Whoever pays the most gets the most, okay? I think TriMet is actually, you know, 
their mark, their self-created market, their phony, they call it a market, but it's, it's fake. The self-created market for operators is way undervalued. They, and the so-called technocracies will not create the market they need. They, they refuse to do what's necessary to fill the ranks. That's because they're criminal. They're part of the criminal class. Job with our recruitment team as working with all the local partners. And see, um, Sam's having a great time. He's traveling all over the country and meeting with all the other uh, elite class criminals, you know, the parasite class, I call them. We're just having a great, great all time while all your riders are suffering because of your mismanagement. And you're still making them pay. You won't even give them free service. I mean, you could, you could at least do that and say it's fair free until we get this straightened out. But you're such a criminal and such a sociopath, you won't even do that. All of the business owners and stakeholders uh, to get that information out there. Any other questions? <sighs> Thank you, Tom. Um, Sam, I'll turn it back over to you. Tom, thanks for the update. Come on, Ozzy. Get off that phone and start asking some questions. I'm very disappointed in you, Ozzy. You know? Look at him. He's he's so colorful. I'm, he knows he knows how to design things, doesn't he? I guess he is a designer, isn't he? And I just want to let everybody know, this is hard. Um, it isn't hard. Lots if you just looked at the airlines this weekend, yeah, they're what's going too. on, 3,000 flights that stranded people across the United States and actually globally. And they are in this And they're following the same playbook as everybody else. It's all, they're following the same austerity. The airlines are following the austerity playbook. All of the businesses are doing this. It's a worldwide movement. It's, it's the new world order, it's the great reset, it's the build back worse. Crisis of trying to do the same things that we are trying to do. And the key piece here is being reliable, making sure that the customers that need the service are able Well, you're not reliable, so shut the fuck up. Able to get to opportunities get um, the, in a timely manner. They can't get the shit. They can't get the shit on your transit system. That's what we want to do. And, we will strengthen this operator shortage up. Um, and I know that the entire agency is supporting us to, to move in that direction. And we've reached out to all of our partners locally and, yeah, and regionally to work with us as well. Liar, liar, so, thanks for the update. However, despite this operator shortage, um, TriMet and the community will have something to celebrate in September. And that's the launch of our Frequent Express it's 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 nothing it's it's not anything there's nothing to celebrate here at all i mean you you had a little pork barrel i i bet you it doesn't even i bet you this fx ain't even going to do shit to change anything i bet you it's just as unreliable as everything else fx it's a new type of bus service um more than two years of construction on the vision transit is coming to an end it's nearly completed and we have already begun the 100 day countdown to the start of service. Actually, in fact, we are at 87 days right now uh, from the start of FX2 division line, which will begin running September 18th. So hopefully all of you are able to attend our opening ceremony and staff will get that information out to you and get it on your calendars. We will be operating our new 60 foot articulated FX buses. They're gonna run every 12 minutes. And the majority of the day, we will carry more riders than our standard buses. Um, we will have transit priority lanes um, and signals along that route. There will be multiple door boardings on the buses and then multiple back storage on board. Uh, that bus will move riders faster and more efficiently from Gresham into downtown Portland. Um, a celebration day is in the works, as I stated. On September 17th, you will all be notified, um, if not already notified. Um, that's the day before FX service start money. Next one, i just give you a quick update on our ridership. Uh, we provided nearly 4.5 million rides in May. While that's down 46% from May of 2019 before the pandemic. However, though, the key here, it's the second month in a row 
that weekly ridership averaged more than a million rides a week. So, in fact, rides increased by more than 176,000 rides in May over April, and our weekly ridership was up by 25.5% compared to May of last year. Yeah, so, they're riding, and they're being tortured while they're riding. It's like, this is not pretty seen. People are trying to ride. They don't, they don't really know what's going on. It's, uh, they're not... They don't keep up to date with what's actually happening at TriMet. I truly believe that people are coming back to the system, um, and we need to make sure we take care of this operator shortage issue so that we can put more service out on the street. Lastly, I'd like to provide an update on our transit-oriented development program and also what our TOD team has been up to. So this, this month's presentation will focus on the efforts that have been ongoing in order to create a regional TOD implementation plan. Lance Ertz and our real estate and transit oriented development director, he joins us now with some members of his team to really give us an update. So Lance, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, General Manager uh, Good morning, President Simmons and directors. As uh, the General Manager mentioned, we're gonna, here today to give you an update on one of the important pieces of- And now here's the completely, this is one thing that I'm completely against the transit system being part of. Tr Transit-oriented development has hijacked transit from riders into property developers. The work that the TOD team has been pursuing over the last year or so, and that's our regional TOD implementation plan. And we will also give a just really brief update on the status of the Hollywood Transit Center project after we talk through the uh, regional TOD plan. So next slide, please. As you recall, in May of 2020, the board approved the adoption of TriMet's Transit Development Guidelines. And the guidelines are really the backbone of our work, and they set out the overarching principles, goals, and strategies for the TOD program. The work we've been doing on the original TOD implementation plan is really designed to put a finer point on how the program will operate, how sites will be prioritized for development, how that development will occur, including things like community engagement and transparency, both on a program level and a project level. Uh, I'd also like to point out that this work was fully funded by a grant we received from ODOT, so thank you to ODOT for that. It was very, very helpful in helping us get a consultant on board um, to help A consultant? Plans. They got a consultant. That's all they do. They have so many managerial uh, useless staff, but they keep hiring consultants. They, the pork just flows. It just doesn't end there. Um, as everyone knows, Turner's business plan also highlights TOD as an important tool to support its sustainability and equity goals. And I think everyone here knows and agrees um, that TOD has been an agency priority over the last several years. Uh, Portland TriMet invented it. Okay, their their invention was light rail and transit-oriented development. And that became a worldwide movement started by the crook, Neil Goldschmidt, who came up with the plan for light rail, he came up with the graft and he figured out how to graft billions of dollars by using light rail. You don't hear much about him, but he's still on the take. I mean, he's just like all the other oligarchs, a pedophile. And uh, so TriMet does lead the way in this. And of course, they have no business in this because it's not transit. There used to be a day when transit agencies did transit. Not anymore. All right, next slide, please. So why do we want to create a regional TOD plan? Um, for many of the reasons I, I just kind of kind of touched on, we wanted to build on the TOD guidelines and give ourselves the ability to have a, a document that provides more direction on how we're gonna implement the guidelines. Uh, we wanted to increase transparency for the program. <laughs> when the TOD guidelines were being adopted, we heard a lot about that, about transparency. And we've done, a, I think, a very good job. We have a TOD website now that sets things out um, for anyone to see. There's no transparency at TriMet. They're lying again. They won't even tweet this board meeting to their account with 70,000 followers. You're a liar. I'm going to say it every time I run into a lie, I'm going to call them out. But we also want this process to increase transparency for the program. You're a liar. 
the TID plan will establish community engagement guidelines, which is also a priority for both the program and uh, the community, as we heard during the adoption process for the TID guidelines. Um, provide a site inventory, uh, evaluation and prioritization process for the sites that TriMet owns that are potential development sites. So kind of get a handle on what we have, establish a process for how we're going to evaluate the sites that we have, and then prioritize sites that are potentially ripe for development. Um, development typologies, really consider what types of development might be appropriate for each individual site that we have in our inventory. Uh, you know, there's a strong focus on affordable housing right now, but maybe not every site is, is um, best for affordable housing. Maybe we want something else, retail or office or, you know, whatever the case may be. So evaluate that, uh, which typology is appropriate for each site and provide an imp implementation framework. Um, help give us some guidance on how we're going to do our work and implement these development projects. So that's a, that's a broad overview. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleagues, Fiona Lyon and Guy Ben, to talk through the implementation plan in a little more detail. Great. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us, Fiona Lyon, design manager. Um, so this is a really exciting time for TriMet in the region. Uh, for anyone aware of the 20... <laughs> this is an exciting time for TriMet. <laughs> Jesus. Disconnected elites everywhere you go. 40 growth plan that the metro region has set out. Uh, this plan really helps TriMet gear up and deliver upon land uses that we've long envisioned kind of around our existing and future transit assets. Uh, and it's really to create a vibrant, compact, mixed use neighborhood uh, and provide those sustainable kind of growth measures that, uh, that Lance mentioned. Um, so a lot of other transit agencies are also doing this process, uh, really developing a transit-oriented development program, looking at their real estate holdings, uh, and really trying to identify future opportunities. Um, so the whole goal of this plan is really to serve as a roadmap. Uh, so we are here, as shown in the red box, uh, developing and crafting this regional TOD plan. Uh, we're working with some local consultants, MIG and Echo Northwest, and really leaning, leaning on their expertise in planning and real estate. Um, we've developed a advisory stakeholder group. Uh, and that's really an advisory of, uh, stakeholder community group. and land use experts who have land a, use experts. They don't have a transit system, but they have land use experts. I'm I'm very insulted by all of this. Regional representation. Uh, and really have helped shape the development of this plan criteria, uh, engagement guidelines, and just general best practices. Best practices, um, best practices for a transit system that doesn't exist. They're just lucky nobody listens to me. We're also working with our jurisdictional partners um, to really understand you know, how we collaborate on these sites, position them, change zoning, uh, sort of improve the existing components and qualities around them. Um, so I really, before we leave this slide, I just want to stress that this plan is not determining a use on specific sites. Uh, the purpose of this plan is really to provide transparency so that all of our stakeholders, uh, community members, developers, partners, can really understand how TriMet is implementing its plan and where we can interact to advance these projects for implementation. Uh, so it's really to give stakeholders a voice and understand, you know, this is their voice is important throughout the whole process um, as we kind of tee up projects for the community. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I'm going to kind of walk through the framework, uh, just really kind of broadly. It's got four general steps in the plan. Uh, again, it's really kind of inventorying and determining if our real estate assets are viable as a TV project. What is garbage, will you? Look at this garbage. There's, they're spending millions of dollars on this shit, but they don't have a transit system. It's garbage. It's an insult. It's insulting. So step one, just purely collecting. What do we even own? Where is it? Step two is really create, collecting like existing features about those sites. So, um, looking at the size and the shape and adding some qualitative and quantitative metrics to those. Uh, very data-driven. 
Step three is more of an objective screen. We've got three broad considerations, TriMet core needs, equity lens update, equity lens. and a opportunity equity index. Lens, we'll get into folks. those in a minute. And step four uh, is really the making sure lens. that we're balancing our investments and our time and energy you know, across the region. Um, so looking at prioritization of TOD sites and how we implement those further. Um, so, as you can see on the left in the gray box, uh, this is really sort of the, the framework of our plan. Again, it's to understand the TOD sites that we own, are they viable sites for future development? And if so, they become, they break off, they will become their own projects um, that will have, you know, further site planning, engagement, uh, and a delivery framework. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to kind of walk through a bit more of the first two steps on the left. Uh, again, it's really inventory what we have. Look at these many different characteristics, uh, a lot of spatial components. Um, and so, so quantitative metrics, uh, that's more of a binary sort of yes, no. Uh, what is the zoning? What is the connectivity? Access to jobs, access to amenities. Uh, grocery, park, open space, healthcare, all sort of very measurable things. Who gives a fuck? Uh, we also have a qualitative analysis, and that's really looking at the more fine grained qualities. You know, is there a mix of uses already around a site, um, or is it surrounded by vacant parking lots? Um, you know, there's a bus stop. Is it purely a bus stop, or is there a transit shelter? Is there lighting? You know, what is the sort of qualitative aspect to the site? Um, and then on the right side of the screen, we have, again, our three sort of objective screens that will apply in step three. Uh, Trimet for needs for operations. This one's really important to the agency. It's garbage. I'm not just making sure that Garbage. Really just trying to understand what we have. See, look at this. Look at this. Match partial types and type off. The look at this. Look um, at this. They're spending, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this. It's got nothing to do with transit. And with that, I'm going to hand it to my colleague, uh, Guy Ben, to kind of summarize, you know, what we do, what we do next. Thank you, Fiona. And next slide, please. Um, good, good morning, President Simmons. Uh, oh, we have board a third uh, My name is Guy Ben. I'm the program manager for Transit Oriented Development. Oh, um, so I'm going to talk through quickly just how the next steps for the plan. Um, this garbage, I'm moving it along. We've had regional groups, land use experts, this. community experts with regional footprint provided oh my God. Sites, um, including oh stakeholder my God. I, I can't watch. Oh, wait, wait. Let's, here's, the next slide. Let's, let's listen to the Hollywood part, though. That I want to we go to the next slide, please. Hard, Hollywood. Okay, Rippy, Hollywood. Um, we've been to the board several times. I got to take a picture of this for Rippy. Hollywood Hub. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Wait time to discuss this project. Most recently in January when we had approval of the contractors uh, um, contract for uh, for the design services um, and again back in December to approve the outline project. Uh, oh yeah, now who's arguing with me that this, oh yeah, it was uh, Jake. <laughs> I don't know if he'll watch this, but he's, he's saying that this hasn't been approved and I was trying to tell him. It's already approved. The Hollywood thing is approved. I don't know what hearings they're having, but it's got nothing to do with the. They've already decided what's going to happen here. Economics. Um, we've been engaging sort of since project inception uh, back in 2020 and, and before on, on the design of the project. And today, what I want to inform the board is a significant change that we've managed to secure. Um, with um, support um, and really insight from some of the community advocates, including Mr. Allen, who spoke earlier this morning, on basically uh, a change to the site which allows uh, affordable housing to be delivered on the entire site. And on the left-hand side here, you see uh, what was the site plan uh, at the beginning of this year, and there was a boundary that prevented affordable housing uh, development in the top right-hand corner of the site that's shaded white. Um, further to understanding the, the origins of that boundary, TriMet went to federal agencies, uh, HUD, Housing and um, Development, uh, the Census Bureau, and also the IRS, and then to state agencies, OHCS, to basically get a resolution that allowed for a tax credit basis boost over the entire site. And that has allowed us to move to a new site plan, which you see on the right-hand side here, which provides a 
a better footprint building that has the activation on the housing street that uh, you know, the city has been looking for and provide more of our affordable housing units. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, we will come back and present this again to the board, but because it's sort of breaking news, uh, we wanted to bring it to the board's attention. We're going to be going to the Hollywood Design, or to the Design Commissioners, the City's Design Commissioners on July 7th. Uh, to sort of get their input on these new plans. But what you see here on the left is a rendering of uh, the new mapping that, that we've been working on with our partner, Bridge Housing, and a site plan that shows how the ramp and the public space and the new bus and, and, and other facilities are evolving as we go through design. And we're still very early on in the design process, uh, really about 10, 15% design. But we're, it's beginning to come to life, and hopefully you can see the improvement in terms of site footprint. Wait, 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 there it is. I got to make this picture. I got I got rip, Rippy here. There it is, Rippy. There it is, Ripster. Come on. Public spaces that we've been able to achieve with support from community advocates. So that wraps up today's presentation, and uh, we're very happy to take any questions uh, on either the Hollywood projects or really more focused on, on today's topic, the regional TOD plan. Thank you. <laughs> Fucking garbage. Director Gonzalez? Oh, you're actually going to say something, Ozzy? Thank you very it. much, President Simmons. Um, I appreciate to the TOD team, I appreciate the update. Thanks so much. I've been super curious to know what's been going on with TOD. Um, and I'm glad to see that there's some advancement on the regional planning and there's more documents to publish for the, the market to respond to. The market! Um, so I got a couple the questions, market, which simple ones, exist. Um, really uh, around the priority sites. Um, I didn't hear in the presentation, I might have missed it, you might have said it. Um, did you identify, how many priority sites have you identified, and are and, we... And right here is the encapsulation of why your transit service has failed, because the transit agencies have moved away from providing transit into this, into providing property development, and that's why there is, that's why your transit system is in collapse right now, because they've put their money into this, and it's unfortunate... But this is America, man, land of the dead. We limiting ourselves to looking at priority sites within the areas that TriMet has current jurisdiction over, or are we also looking at privately held land? Um, I'll start, and then you know, Fiona or Lance would like to jump in. So we we are we're not we're trying to avoid creation of a list. Um, the 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 design of the plan is being put together in a way that it can be dynamic and react to third-party requirements, primate needs, equity, changing equity uh, you know, considerations. So ultimately, we haven't concluded and produced the sort of the next five or six targets that we think are the highest priority. Um, but we will be, um, as we complete the plan, um, and we, we, we're due to have our final stakeholder advisory group meeting in, in, in a week or two, we will have a list, a bucket list of, of the primed COD sites and the catalytic COD sites. And depending on resources, and there are a number of projects that sort of are, are moving forward due to third party influences, we will probably, yeah, we will go make a recommendation to the to the general manager and to the board as to the, the two or three sites that you know, the TOD team has capacity to focus on and move forward. So, so the answer, we haven't got the... the Ozzy, that was a useless there. question. Fuck you, Ozzy. Thank you, thank you. And it sounds like that could be a future step to be Fuck looking you, at Ozzy. some high-priority sites. Um, would, would that... Would those sites then, are you thinking at that point you would issue on a parcel basis? And are those, would those parcels be, again, land that is within the current TriMet purview? Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, I know I didn't address the second part of your question, but Derek Gonzalez. Yeah, the answer is, is that our focus with the plan is on TriMet controlled parcels. Um, 
Now, it's designed in a way that we may own a small parcel and there may be a private developer with a large project next door, in which case that would become part of our focus. Um, but if we don't have such an opportunity, then we can focus on one of our other parcels or maybe a larger parcel. So um, it is it is primary owned land um, because what we do recognize is certainly um, we, we cannot control third party owned land. Um, and also, you know, TriMet, first and foremost, we are a transit agency, not a developer. So <laughs> no, you're not a transit agency. You're a development agency. Your transit agency is, is, is in tatters. But your development agency is running at full speed. You, there's been no cutbacks at the, at the development agency. Has there? No, there has not. The project to fruition, we're bringing in a development partner to help us deliver it. Thank you. Director Wayne. Thank you. Um, I just had a, a just a comment. First, I love the obviously the affordable housing approach and working with bridge housing. Um, I think that's fantastic. Uh, my other question was around um, affordable housing. that mural that currently is the affordable housing is code for crony capitalism, just so you understand beautiful mural that exists um, currently where I think the buses do their go arounds and, you know, where people hop on the max. Um, will that be preserved? Um, no, destroy it. Get rid I of it. I hope so, but it in <laughs> I wanted to ask. I know we're not even close to like construction, but in terms of the uh, imagining of this. Close thing. it down. It sounds like yes. Yeah. Okay. Fiona, do you want to take that one? I'll, I'll let Fiona answer that. Sure. Thank you, Director Wynn. Um, yes, so we recognize that the mural is a community asset. Um, the mural represents the complete failure of TriMet and Portland police. That was what happened there was preventable. The police didn't prevent it and TriMet had no, it's, it's one of the best representations of how government fails our citizens. There is, is what happened on that max. And so we are looking at in how we redevelop the site. Uh, the the ramp is not up to code today, uh, and it sort of prevents the future development. So we do need to create a new structure. We, we are very conscious of how the tribute gets uh, recrafted into the future site plan. So we're looking at an inventory of you know what are the assets and elements of it that people love. Um, and really trying to shape it into the new design. Um, so much more to come on that. Uh, we are working with the, the artist, Sarah Farhat, to understand and really create that approach. Thank you. I really appreciate that because I remember... Yeah, you know, it's nothing like, you know, let's have some uh, virtue signaling, you know. Oh, we love it. We It's better to choose love. Sorry you're dead and we didn't protect you, but we'll choose love now. Actually, one of my first TriMet official board engagement was the commemoration of that mural and tribute, um, you know, to the lives um, that were unfortunately lost with the, um, with the, the max stabbing several years ago. So um, thank you for engaging the artists and, um, you know, the community that was hopefully also um, impacted by that. Um, Guy, I have uh, one question based on the new schematics for the expansion of the, of the building. And it has to do with, it looked like there was some kind of an island um, on Halsey. Um, there was this kind of oblong, and I know there's been community concern about bus access and the change of bus access. Is, is that intended to provide um, a, 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 an area for buses to come into uh, along Halsey, and, and is that that an improvement from the perspective? If it is, is that viewed as an improvement by the many folks that had issues with the change in location of the bus stops? Thank you, President Simmons. Yes, it is. It is that that area that. To the, just to the, on the south side of Halsey Street is a dedicated bus pull-in um, and drop-off area. 
Um, we, we've done some measurements uh, in terms of the distance uh, from the existing foot of the ramp to the current bus stops to the new foot of the ramp to the existing bus stop. And ultimately, it's, it's a small change. It is a small increase in distance. Um, but we've also analyzed um, you know, the passenger transfer between max and buses. And really, the majority of bus customers here at Hollywood are either originating or ending their journeys at Hollywood and not transferring. There is a small amount of the transfer, and we are considering those individuals. And actually, the transfer will be much improved because of the improved ramp. So. Uh, and the improved environment around the ramp structure. So, and Rippy will be happy. Close it down. Bulldoze it. <laughs> Don't build anything there. Just bulldoze the whole area and put it, put up a parking lot. <laughs> okay. it's, there's always a balance to make, but it's um yeah we we have been working hard. Um, yeah, and the balance is the riders get fucked. That's that's the balance. That's that's the that's what always happens. The the, the actual bus riders get fucked, and that's been going on for decades here to basically make sure the design is optimal um there was a time when the bus riders were king and i happened to be employed there when they were king that's all changed 25 years the whole system has changed and from what it was and also to improve the crossing across Halsey street for those <laughs> passengers that are traveling into the neighborhood it won't it'll be a, shitty. You know, an accident black spot that has not been addressed yet yeah thank you director bellman Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate hearing about the process and the public involvement. The public involvement. Kind of what public involvement? All the public testimony was against closing down Hollywood, you liars. Area for transit and development. But I'll also say that, of course, we're... I mean, this is, this is the Agenda 2030, by the way. This is the Agenda 2030. You take the surfs. You stick them in a in a publicly in a building like this. You call it affordable housing. Developers make millions off of it, and you make them dependent on public transportation. Okay, that's Agenda Twenty Thirty. That way, you can ha the government has complete control over their lives, and that's that's the agenda that we're we're fast tracking in our lives now. Is that government is making it so that we're all going to be dependent on them, and unfortunately. The, the citizens are just too stupid to see what's happening. What do we got there? I got to We are in the middle of a housing crisis, and we're also in the middle of yeah, that, that's uh, funny. Very, yeah. a, a great, very continued great reduction in transit ridership. And so we really need transit-oriented development. No, you don't. Possible. That's got nothing to do with transit ridership, you dumb fuck. Uh, so I guess I'd like to just contribute. Uh, Although I guess, you know, if you force them to use transit, I mean, that's the, that's the playbook. You force people into transit, you know, make gas so expensive that you're forced to use it. It's all part of that social engineering. Uh, my thought that I hope that we could really get going God, this on, thing just identifying on forever. projects and getting started on construction. I, I, again, I understand the importance of God, process. Over an hour here. But Okay, the gateway, on. for example, is a location that has been discussed as a place for transit-oriented development. And, you know, I know you don't want to kind of jump the queue and you've come up with a process, but um, but please, I guess, count me as a as a member of the community saying let's let's get a housing constructed as quickly as possible. Thank you. Yeah, and that's years away. Just, just... It's only going to help. You know, it doesn't it doesn't make an it doesn't do anything for the homeless population this is all lies to super quickly on that on that point um we haven't stopped <laughs> we, we've we've continued to get um interest from third parties so we're talking to an affordable housing developer about a site we own out in Tualatin. the fuller the fuller park and ride project is wrapping up construction and about to come online obviously hollywood's in the process that's been a complicated one but we're, we're continuing to do the work um, yeah. while well, this happens, it, it does take longer than I think everyone would like, <laughs> ideally. But. And that's good for you. The longer it takes, the more money you make. That's always the case in government. The longer you drag it out, the more money is made. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no. That's the same in war. The longer you drag out the war, the more money is made. Fuller, a station project is a great one. And, and yeah. so I... I um, it's terrific. What, what are they doing? What are they doing in Fuller? What a park and ride? Is that what I heard? Do those, and uh, that should be a priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, General Manager DeSue, anything else? All right, just want to thank Lance and Guy and Fiona and your team for being here today. Really appreciate that. And as the board has stated, let's keep pushing and we'll give an update to the board as soon as possible. Thank you. And with that, President Simmons, that concludes my report. All right, thank God that's over. <laughs> Painful.